Hi everyone, so in today's video I'm going to be editing your work. I'm so excited to finally be uploading this video a few weeks ago, probably a lot longer than that. I put out a call for you guys to send me your work so I could line edit it in an upcoming video, just like I have my line editing series where I edit my own work. I got quite a few submissions to my surprise. Because of that, I have to split the video into two parts. So this video is going to cover eight of those submissions and then hopefully soon I will have the other eight upcoming. I just wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who submitted. This is like a really brave thing to do so I really appreciate that these writers trusted me with their work. A lot of the work ranges from adult literary fiction to some poetry to young adult. There's like some contemporary. Like I said, I really appreciate that these writers were so vulnerable and were so brave enough to send me their work and I would really appreciate it if everyone could be kind in the comments. This is not an easy thing to do. I just want to make sure that everybody is being kind to each other in the comments. Please refrain from critiquing the work just because they haven't consented to that. Of course, if one of the writers who's featured in this video asks for more critique in the comments, then that is a different story. But because they haven't consented, I would really appreciate, because they did trust me with the work, that everyone is just like kind in the comments and super supportive. I also wanted to mention that I didn't get to cover every single comment that I made. So this video is set up where I did critiques before this video, so in advance, and now in the video I'm just explaining my thought process and how I did that. That's just because I got a lot more critiques than I thought I was going to, and because of that, it takes a lot longer to do these critique videos when I'm critiquing everything like live. So this is kind of like one of my other videos, Line Edit With Me too, where I just go back over all the critiques I already made, which allows me to be a bit more in depth with my responses. So I still hope that this is helpful and enjoyable for you guys to watch. But yeah, because of that, I couldn't cover every single comment that I made, including some minor line edits, some minor comments that basically I think would only really benefit the writer and that I wasn't sure needed to be in there for educational purposes. And also the writer's final comment, I left like a, like a paragraph at the end for every writer. I just wanted the writer to have that personally. I am not going to lie, I've been really nervous Nervous to put out this video just because I want it to be as good as I could make it. Like I said, I really appreciate the writers who sent in their work and so I didn't want to do injustice by not like properly setting this video up and so I've been sitting on it for a while. I'm kind of on a hiatus from my channel and I was originally supposed to start the new year with these videos but I just didn't want to rush into it. I want to make sure that these videos are as great as I want them to be. I'm not sure they're exactly, it's exactly how I wanted it to turn out but I did try my best so let me know if there's ways that I can improve in the future. I also wanted to mention this is just my opinion. This is also for like speaking to the writers who submitted you do not have to take the feedback that I said and any feedback should be interrogated by the writer themselves. I have a poetry professor who has the best philosophy on taking feedback. He was like, so when you're like revising your poems and this takes, you know, this works for like fiction or whatever too. Find the feedback that you like and that you agree with and that, that speaks to you and that will help you attain your vision. And then throw out the rest. For the writers who I didn't cover in this video, I will hopefully try to have your video up as soon as possible. I hope you guys enjoy this. I will see you in another video. Hi everyone. All right, so we are in Word and right now I am looking at Angie's submission. Thank you so much for submitting, Angie. Angie submitted for the prose category and this is going to be adult horror short fiction. So this is called Cedarwood. The bright yellow lights shone above him and she could smell his sweat from afar. Her nose crinkled, sticky fingers digging into the meat of her palm. An old habit, a terrible habit, one she could never quite get rid of. I think it's in the cupboard under the sink, he finally said, smiling sheepishly. You know I always remember to buy it. He didn't, once. But he did correct his mistake after she told him he'd forgotten. He'd wasted exactly 73 minutes of precious time. He came back begging for forgiveness. The silence that followed was taking shape of the unlived living room with no effort. It flooded the corners of seasick green walls and the old television and the yellow couch and the fine china they kept in the far right edge in case any important guests show up. A perfect dollhouse room. The sting of nail against flesh didn't feel like anything until she felt a familiar surface tension break and her mind did what it did best. It wandered towards the kitchen. 
Her husband never stopped her, never offered help. He was a meek man, a terrible man for her, but she had Lilith with him, so she stayed. She stayed even after her death because of people's expectations, and she was always a people pleaser first, and a housewife second, and grieving mother third, and almost forensic science graduate fourth. The detergent was not behind the stone from the garden. Excuse any formatting issues that it was not Angie that was me, like, running amok in <laughs> the <laughs> document. So the first sentence, the bright yellow lights shone above him. So my first comment was, I wasn't sure if this was an excerpt or an opening passage, so that could certainly uh, change some of my interpretation, so keep that in mind. But I was wondering if it is the start of a new story or start of a scene, is there a way to ground us a bit more into this setting and establish a sense of place? Where are they that there's a bright yellow light shining above this person's? I'm not really sure where the bright yellow lights are coming up from. And there's so many different options, like a street lamp, it could be a bedroom light, it could be a kitchen light. And so I just was hoping for a little bit more clarity on that with just setting up the scene a little bit more, establishing your sense of place with a few more descriptive details of the setting first. I wanted to give a positive comment here with the phrase, an old habit, a terrible habit. I really like the building of the narrative that this habit is not just old, but it's also terrible. I think that's a great showcase of voice. That slight repetition, almost like the narrator building on what they're saying. Like, no, it's not just an old habit, it's a terrible habit. Then my next comment is for the word sheepishly. I was wondering if there's any body language that could be subbed for this adverb to show this man man's sheepishness instead of utilizing the adverb. And I think it might also be more visually compelling to see an image of this person. So a few examples that I noted in my comment is how is he standing? What physically indicates his sheepishness? So instead of relying on the adverb and having the reader sort of come up with an image of sheepishness on their own, perhaps you could characterize this person by describing so showing versus telling exactly what they look like rather than using like an adverb to imply it but not really fully describe it. So is there any sort of physical indication that he is sheepish? So my next comment was regarding the word it here and I was just wondering what it is and I was wondering if specifying here may help a reader construct a more realized image as they read unless it is supposed to be a mystery which again could be purposeful withholding. I wasn't certain in this instance. I was having a bit of trouble understanding the continuity here and I wasn't sure if this silence was referring to silence that occurs after this one time he forgot to buy it whatever it is or if we're back to the present timeline of the man and the woman conversing in the room with the yellow light. How I'm reading it is he didn't once but he did correct his mistake after she told him he'd forgotten is like a dip into the past. Um, so I wasn't sure if this here is the fictive present. This is the fictive past here. And then I wasn't sure if this is supposed to be back in the present or if this is back in the past. I hope that that makes sense. I know that that was a little bit confusing. Just kind of a little bit more clarification. Like, was this the silence that followed after he forgot to buy the thing? Or is this silence that is following while they're in, they're in the room with the bright yellow lights that are shining above him? The next phrase that I commented on it was, The sting of nail against flesh didn't feel like anything until she felt a familiar surface tension break and her mind did what it did best. So this phrase is making me wonder when this part of the scene is taking place. Is she back in the place with the yellow light or with her husband? Is he still standing there? Or if so, could we have an indication of where he is now and that she stopped pressing her nails into her palm? Or is this still in the dip in memory when she was upset that he forgot to buy it? Um, I wasn't certain because she starts digging her nails like up here in the first paragraph, which I was assuming was the fictive present. And then we jump into the past right here. I think that this is her like jumping back into the present. What is supposed to be a flashback here and what's supposed to be the present? I really do think an easy way to fix that would be chronology tags. So like then, now, two weeks ago, and then sort of make it a bit more clear where you are on the timeline. And my next comment was on the phrase never offer to help. And I was wondering what has he never offered to help her for? Um, has he never offered to help her like stop pressing her nails? Has he never offered to help her in the house at her job? What has he never offered to help 
in. Uh, I think that this is an important part of the story because I think it is revealing character in the husband and also revealing character in um, the partner because she doesn't seem very happy that he's not helping her with anything. So I just think this could be expanded a little bit since I do think it is crucial to this relationship. What is he not helping her with? I really like this line. She was always a people pleaser first and housewife second and grieving mother third and almost forensic science graduate fourth. I thought that this was fantastic characterization in such a small space. The list indicates priorities this character has that do not particularly benefit her. And this speaks to so much of her subservience of always putting others above her. And I thought that this was very compelling. Um, I think that this is very efficient characterization. It's only one line, but I really get an, a, an idea for who this character is. She truly does seem to take like the brunt of everything in her life rather than prioritizing herself. And so I think this is a really excellent job job here. So I hope that that was helpful. I'm going to jump into the next submission. All right, so now let's jump into a submission sent by Anna, and this is a young adult fantasy novel. Thank you so much for submitting your work, Anna. So this is called The Way of the Wisps, and I'll just give it a read through. I might mispronounce the island name, and I apologize for that, but I will try my best. It would rain on Caledonian Island. The clouds were dark and heavy, and I knew the feeling well. Despite promising I'd stopped caring about him many years ago, the strain of leaving my father weighed on me. As I made my way down the hillside following the path to the port where the ship was docked, I wondered how long it would rain if water droplets waited years before falling. I couldn't wait to sail away from this place, from the fields I'd planned it played in as a little girl and the things I wished to forget. Leaving was a relief, but it also meant that I would never see my father again. The man who had comforted me from my nightmares, sitting beside my bed, guarding me from the monsters I'd feared in the shadows. No more chances to mend the things that had been broken. My father was supposed to be my protector, but he'd left because he wanted to protect himself from me. And now I was leaving him for good. I tried to block out the image of him lying in his wooden casket, face ashen. Standing over him, I half expected his eyes to open, for him to reach out to me and say, Arabella, you're home, and we would be able to forget everything that had happened. But his hands remained on top of his chest, completely still. So let's just jump into some of the edits that I made. Um, and so the first was regarding just the opening here. Um, it was going to, I think we could just make a bit more concise by saying it would. And so I also removed I'd once called home. And the reason I said that is because I think if I'm understanding correctly, the narrator is leaving this island but hasn't left just yet. So perhaps this phrasing could be adjusted if this is the correct interpretation since she hasn't quite left. So the next phrase is the clouds were dark and heavy and I knew the feeling well. And I said in my comment, I wonder if there's an opportunity here to flesh out this image. The clouds are dark and heavy. How does this heaviness feel to the narrator? What are the specifics of this feeling? Do they feel it in their skin, their hair? How do they know the feeling? Does it manifest physically, spiritually? There may be space to clarify here and also build on a stronger image of the storm beyond the clouds just being dark and heavy. I knew the feeling well may also be a familiar phrase that can also be specified if not removed. Perhaps we can see a bit more of the environment. What does that look like exactly? Interpreting that through more concrete, specific, vivid details could help paint a more clear image in a reader's mind. I highlighted the strain of leaving my father weighed on me. I said that this is really interesting, but I was a bit confused as to how it related to the storm. So I was wondering, does looking at the storm conjure these memories in the narrator's mind? And how do we get from the storm to dad? The phrase is, I wish to forget leaving was a relief. And I just wanted to know, why does the narrator want to forget their home? Did something horrible happen here? Why was leaving a relief? What do they get away from? Those are a few things to ponder. I wonder even if the writer could just slightly expand on that. And just even like, a sentence what happened here that made leaving so so much better than staying and so my next comment is regarding this sentence I tried to block out the image of him lying in his wooden casket face ashen and I said I feel like there needs to be a little bit more present action right here before the sentence so that a reader knows where the narrator is physically placed in the scene so we know the narrator is walking to the boat so is she doing something on the boat as she tries to block out the image of her father jumping back to the boat briefly could help in clarifying where the character is as she blocks out these memories. So right now the writer has laid out the scene as follows. There's a bit of like a fictive present right here in this first paragraph as the character is walking to the boat. And then we jump into some like internal narrative right here. And it's kind of like a dip into the past as the narrator reminisces on why they're excited to leave. And so I was wondering if it's possible that the writer could jump back into the fictive present a little bit before we 
try to block out the image of him lying in the wooden casket. Can we just jump back into the present scene um, just very briefly so that we can place where the character is? Because right now I see this image of a character walking to a ship that's docking, but I'm not sure what the character's doing or what I'm supposed to be seeing in these paragraphs. I can't place the character. And because of that, I get a bit muddy in how I'm supposed to be visualizing the scene. Even if the writer could just add something like right here before that I try to block out the image, like right before that sentence, to jump back into the present active scene. What is the character doing? Have they arrived to the boat? Is the boat close? Could we just get a bit more of like a physical placement of the character instead of continuing on this internal narrative, just so that a reader can place themselves a bit easier into the scene. So this is kind of linking back to another comment. Um, it's regarding we would be able to forget everything that had happened. And my comment says, I'm intrigued to know what happened. I wonder if you could even drop a subtle hint here so a reader has a better idea for why we should be invested in Arabella's disdain for her home. So um, this was kind of relevant to what I said here, like up here, like I wish to forget. Leaving was a relief. Could the reader just get a small hint at what had happened? Is this something devastating that happened to Arabella? Can we get a hint at what happened? It doesn't have to be outright. I understand wanting to still withhold, but I think just a small hint in a sentence or two could do a lot of good in sort of foreshadowing and latching a reader in. That's all of my edits for Anna. Thank you so much for submitting and let's move on to the next writer. So now we're going to be reading a submission from Anthony. This is a pro submission and it is adult literary fiction slash magical realism and short fiction. So thank you so much for submitting Anthony. This is called I Am the Mother. I want a boy in my English class before he knows he wants me. Marriage is something that will happen in the future. A future of I do's for me, him conceding because of our vows on his part. I'm in my bedroom doing algebra homework, algebra homework, solving for X and Y, on the verge of giving up. The equation our teacher gave us is filled with knots and frayed ends. I'm plugging in random numbers to see if they match up, copying answers from the back of the textbook and faking my work with a smile on my face. I can't focus. My mind is trained on him. I pass him a note that proclaims my love for him because I'm too scared to tell him face to face. He reads my note and looks up at me with a sad look in his eyes, like he can see our future paved in front of him. My mother calls me her miracle baby. We have rabbits in our house that she claims she birthed herself. White rabbits with twitchy noses and craving for celery. Red, perpetually irritated looking eyes that bore into me as if they know I'm not one of them. As if they know I'm an outsider, a fluke. Soon my mother is pregnant again and I catch her in the living room eating tomatoes she's pulled straight from our garden, juice and seeds soaking her chin and staining her maternity clothes. So I thought that this was a really great example of some playing with point of view. So let's jump right into my edits. So my next comment is in regards to the line, marriage is something that will happen in the future. And I said, I think the way this is phrased, it seems to be a bit removed from the voice as it is phrased a bit passively. Marriage will happen to me, not I will get married. To stay in a similar spot psychically with the character, if this could be rephrased to something a bit closer to the voice, like we will get married. So the reason I said that is because I want a boy in my English class before he want, knows he wants me is very immediate. It is very close to the narrator in terms of like psychic distance, very close. Marriage is something that will happen in the future on the other hand, is phrased passively, which means that there's a lot more distance between the narrator and the words that are being said. And so it does seem a bit jilting to go from so close with the narrative I in the first sentence to something a bit farther um, with like the more passive voice in the second. So I was wondering if that could be rephrased for a bit more immediacy. I just wanted to note also that a few of these sentences start with I. I think this actually creates an interesting rhythm that is quite stream of consciousy, but it can almost read a bit choppily. Perhaps read this work out loud. See if any of those I's or I'ms could be removed, if sentences could be combined so you can remove some of those pronouns, just so that they're a little bit less invasive on the page. Here I was wondering if we could see what a sad look looks like in the eyes of this boy and how does his face physically change instead of just saying uh, with a sad look in his eyes. Could that be expanded into an image rather than just narrative summary. So I have a few thoughts um, after this first paragraph. I said, interesting. So something I've noticed is that this opening so far is full narrative summary rather than scene. So it makes the character feel a bit distant slash like the story is just a stream of thought slash stream of consciousness. If that's your intent, that's fine. And I might lean into that more by having the character note more details they notice in this stream of consciousness, almost like an internal, nar internal narrative ambush of details, just so that a reader can at least cling to physical details since the narrative is so poor 
forest slash light. I hope that that makes sense. And what I mean by that is there's no scene and scene is a very immersive thing in writing. Scene is like where you get your dialogue. Scene is where you get your action, where your character is doing things on the page. Narrative summary is kind of just like thoughts. So narrative summary can be a bit airier because there's nothing really physically grounding it into like an image that a reader can see. And so I think stream of consciousness is really an interesting mode of conveying a story because it can get quite airy because you're just in a character's head. You're not really on the page with them physically doing something. And so if the writer's intent is to have this stream of consciousness, I would perhaps suggest surrounding the narrator with a bit more physical detail and I don't mean like I pick up the rock and I sit down that would be like scene so for example I'm in my bedroom doing algebra homework solving for x and y on the verge of giving up after that sentence the writer could implement uh, some details of the world around this character F perhaps like the smell like smells like hot dogs my mom is grilling or something and so at the end of this paragraph like i can't focus my mind is trained on him could we see a little bit more of that in terms of visuals instead of it just being thought i can't focus my mind is trained on him his hair his eyes his blah 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 that could just ground it a little bit more in the physical detail rather than just being kind of airy thought and that makes it a little bit easier to follow when reading I also wanted to note this incredibly specific image with the mother biting into tomatoes like wow wow that is amazing um I did note however that I wasn't certain how we got from the person studying their crush in their room like to the rabbits does the crush remind the narrator of the rabbits why does x trigger y in this instance so x why does the studying trigger y which is the rabbits in this instance so these paragraphs feel like two diff different stories i was wondering if there's like a through line that the writer could pull through to connect them so is there something that connects these two things because if you read them on their own they, they stand on their own because there's nothing in paragraph one about rabbits and there's nothing in paragraph two about studying or the crush so i was just wondering if you could just almost like a cake just like mix in the flour a little bit more, kind of like combine them a little bit more uh, because right now they're quite separated. All right, and so that was my critique for Anthony. So the next submission comes from Carly. It is prose and it's adult literary fiction in the short fiction category. So thank you so much for submitting, Carly. Long way home. Jackie can still make out the August day that shines behind his figure. Jared is on the beach like he always was. Over his shoulder, the, specific, the Pacific Ocean glimmers, the sparkle pushing through the film's grain. The water was crystal clear that that day. It was the end of summer. People always thought that California turned dreary after tourist season. Everyone returned back to their homes elsewhere in the sleepy suburban towns, much like the one Jackie and Jared grew up in, lost their sense of endless sunshine. The photo tells a different story. It seems to scream that there's still some warmth left. Jared is staring into the camera, his dark eyes squinting slightly against the sunlight. His hair, bleached a whitish blonde, sticks up, the wind flapping his flyaways in different directions. He is clad in a black baggy t-shirt from a Doors concert and striped swim trunks that barely reach his kneecaps. Tucked underneath his arm is his trusty wooden surfboard, the mahogany seeming to glow. Jared's watch, the Mickey Mouse one he wore well into his high school years, is wrapped around his left wrist. He is smiling, of course, a big goofy smile, the crooked incisor towards the right side of his mouth sticking out like a fang. Jackie caught him mid-laugh. Perhaps she had said something stupid or someone had tripped off camera. She doesn't remember. All she sees is him. He is 17. He is growing fast. He has his whole life ahead of him. So let's jump into my critique. First, my critique is actually starting with the first sentence because I think this is a really strong opening. So first I just removed um, the filter, like can still, um, and I just con consolidated it into makes out. Jackie makes out the August day instead of Jackie can still, just so that it's a bit more concise. So my comment was this opening's fantastic, but I wonder if there's something you could tweak with the first sentence to really take it to the next level and allow readers to better understand that Jackie's looking at a photograph. Perhaps a clearer way to describe that this is what she's doing, you can start straight out by saying Jackie looks at a photograph of Jared. So the, I was assuming that she was looking at a photograph. I might be wrong about that, so I apologize, but my reading was that Jackie is looking at a photograph of Jared. And so I think the first sentence, Jackie makes out the August day that shines behind his figure, is not really indicating that. And um, I think because of that, it can get a little bit confusing. Like at first, 
a reader might assume that like this is taking place in real time and Jackie is on the beach and looking at Jared. And so I wonder if there is a stronger sentence that the writer could sub here that would indicate that Jackie is looking at a photograph of Jared. Perhaps it's a photo album, something to do with flipping pages in a photo album, just something that gives the reader an indication that Jackie is physically looking at like a legit physical photo. So here's another way you could consolidate phrasing. So it seems to scream that there's still some warmth, le warmth left. So here I removed seems to, and I just put an S on scream. So it, it made it, it screams and removed the that. It screams there's still some warmth left. So that removes a few words already, and it's just a really minor line edit. There are so many beautiful details throughout this piece. Any of the highlights, like down here, whitish blonde, uh, Doris concert t-shirt and stuff, all of that is highlighted. I just adored these um, details, so I just highlighted them. I was also wondering if there was an intention in having this paragraph on its own, just because this is continuing the description of Jared, and Jared's description is in this paragraph, so I was wondering if this could just be moved to the other paragraph above. I also really enjoyed the repetition at the end. He is 17, he's growing fast, he has his whole life ahead of him. That repetition of he, 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 so poetic, but also so emotionally gutting. I think this is a fantastic job of the writer withholding. Gives us a sense that something has happened to Jared, and I still want to know. Like, I'm continuing to read, like, I wish I had more so I could know what happened to Jared, but without actually stating it. And I think this is such a delicate way of going about some sort of loss for Jackie. So, that was my critique for Carly. I really do think this first sentence is what could just be cleaned up a little bit and cleared a little bit, um, perhaps just rephrased or rewritten so that it's more indicative of what is occurring on the page. Thank you so much for submitting, Carly. Let's move on to the next submission. So the next edit is for Chelsea, and this is a pro submission in adult literary fiction, short fiction. And so there's content warning for blood in the context of childbirth in that, just so that you guys know. And this is a piece called Florence Forgive Me. So thank you so much for submitting, Chelsea. I'm just going to give this a read through. Basil Vaughn's mother is a midwife, perpetually on call for every pregnant woman in the town of Jubilee, Wyoming, and sometimes horses. When she leaves in the middle of the night, she kisses Basil's forehead once to wake her, to say, I'll be back, love, then again to send her to sleep. Babies and foals never wait till morning. When the sun rises orange on her bedroom walls, Basil wakes to find her aunt on the couch, asleep under a blanket that is too small to cover her body, or if she's lucky, her mother's listless outline, too exhausted to make it back to bed. Basil has attended deliveries before, though she was too young to remember. According to her mother, she wasn't interested. She imagines herself in one corner of an unfamiliar living room, a toddler in a pack and play, asleep while another entire human being materializes on the rug in front of her. Birth, as she pictures it, requires empty space. There is blood. She finds it sometimes on her mother's clothes in the laundry. Dark burgundy stains, almost black, sometimes so saturated it's impossible to believe it all came from one person. Basil close, closes her eyes and imagines the baby kicking through the skin of his mother's belly like a hatchling pe pecks at its eggshell until it ruptures. When a baby bird does it, though, nobody bleeds. When Basil's old enough, she asks about her father. She presses her mother, says, you said mothers can't have babies by themselves. So my first comment was I really enjoyed this detail where it's like she's on call for every pregnant, pregnant woman in the town of Jubilee, Wyoming, and sometimes even there for horses. So I just thought in terms of continuity, because you mentioned the town names first, mentioning the species of the horse does almost seem like the horses is a town name, even though I do understand what I think the writer is intending here is that Basil von mother is a midwife to pregnant women and horses is there a way to still mention she's on call for horses without grouping it in with the city so this is kind of like a um misplaced modifier almost i am very bad at grammar so i might just be saying all of those things wrong but <laughs> trying my best so right now what's grouped in here is that uh basil vaughn's mother is a midwife perpetually on call for every pregnant woman in the town of jubilee wyoming and sometimes horses so sometimes horses is being grouped in with this noun of town of jubilee wyoming and sometimes horses when it should be grouped in with basil's mother is a midwife so it would look more like that this way horses is being modified in the correct phrase i was also wondering for this phrase babies and foals never wait till morning like what are babies and foals waiting for i assume they don't wait till morning for their mothers like i'm assuming that's what the, the writer meant is like they don't wait 
like they wake up way earlier because they can't wait for their mothers. Um, but the next sentence says when the sun rises, Basil gets up. So it seems like she has waited until morning to wake up. So I was just wondering what this phrase meant. I was a little bit confused. I said, I think what is intended here is that sometimes Basil finds her aunt on the couch covered with the blanket. And sometimes she finds her mother's outline on the couch covered with the blanket. But because of how the sentence is structured, I'm reading it as sometimes she finds her aunt on the couch asleep under a blanket. Or if the aunt is lucky, she's asleep under her mother's listless outline. I think if you could separate these two details into their own clause that could help in conveying your intention. So it's kind of like a similar thing with like the horses like I mentioned. Basil wakes to find her aunt on the couch asleep under a blanket that is too small to cover her body. So that's a clause in its own right and so that can stand on its own. So the writer could technically like put a period there and it would stand on its own. But then the next part of the sentence or if she's lucky her mother's listless outline too exhausted to make it back to bed. So this right now, or if she's lucky, the mother's listless outline is actually connecting to Basil wakes to find her aunt on the couch asleep under a blanket. So her aunt is on the couch asleep under a blanket, or if she's lucky, she's asleep under her mother's listless outline. So I hope that that makes sense. I think the writer just needs to reorder this a little bit just so that like the subject is in the right place. And I really enjoyed the duality here. When a baby bird does it, though, nobody bleeds. But that was Florence. Forgive me. Thank you so much again, Chelsea. Let's move on to the next excerpt. So the next critique is for Joanna. And this is prose, which is adult fantasy flash fiction. So I'm going to give it a read through. She found her aide wincing in the great hall. They had given him a cot in the corner for some semblance of privacy. But when he saw her leaning over him, he said, look how they exiled me. Was it a clean cut? He waved away her question with a hand and then stopped, paling with the effort. I can't hear what the others are saying, he said instead. I suspect they are gossiping about me. She pulled aside his shirt, already unbuttoned, and frowned down at the bandages. Does it hurt? Not as much as seeing the foot soldiers chatter on. I don't suppose you could tell them to take me closer. Said the truth, if you please. I'm sorry if I pronounced his name wrong. Spear wound, he said. I know, I saw you fall. I was lucky. Medic said full recovery's on the table, but it will take months. They gave me something for the pain. He felt around his sheets with his left hand and held up a wooden bit. But of course, that's no use. You see, if you bite down on it, you can't talk. Perhaps that was the idea, she said, smiling now. How many dead? Near 80. We'll know in the morning. She paused. Wouldn't you prefer a quiet room upstairs? No. As she turned to go, she said, I'll have someone bring you a painkiller. And the cot? I don't know. I might want to punish you for charging into the fray when you ordered not to. Silent treatment, as it were. But at the door, she spoke to the nurses and told them to move him to wherever his little heart desired. So my first comment is, where are the bandages exactly? She pulled aside his shirt, already unbuttoned, and frowned down at the bandages. I just wasn't sure where the, the bandages are. Are they, like, on his ribs? Are they on his stomach, uh, where are the bandages? Um, because I wasn't sure where I was supposed to be kind of quote unquote looking as a reader. Um, clearly it's somewhere like in the chest area, but I was wondering if that could just be specified for clarity of image. I also really loved this dialogue. I love the dialogue between this narrator um, and Riven, if I'm saying his name correctly. I think it was just so funny. I laughed out loud so many times. I think that the dialogue itself is incredibly strong. So for example, like you start straight off the bat, look how they exiled me. Like that's kind of dramatic, but it's it's really funny at the same time. And so I think we get a good sense for who Riven is. I think that the writer does a good job of only putting the words where they need to be. There are a few small things like his little heart desire that could be seen as a cliche. In this case, I think that that works, but that could be something that the, the writer could interrogate in later drafts if they did want to make it a little bit more original. But like I said, I don't really think that that is very detrimental. She found her aide wincing in the Great Hall could perhaps be rephrased to be a bit more active. Again, like I didn't think that like it took anything away from the prose. I think that it works in the way that it is. But she found her aide could perhaps be like, Rive and winced in the Great Hall. I do think that this adds a little bit of something else. Like she found her, like she had to like go um, scavenge him out because perhaps he's just difficult to find because from what it seems, he doesn't seem like somebody who's like listening to what she wanted. So um, I thought that that was great, um, but that could be something that the writer may want to reconsider. But let's move on to the next excerpt. Thank you so much for sending it in, Joanna. So the next excerpt is actually a poem by Kim. Thank you so much for submitting, Kim. This is a poem called Crafted Time. 
Tell me again about how we were born at the same instant, even though you're older, wiser, for you can always be one day ahead of time on this earth if only you go far enough from me. Tell me again how time was all man-made, pressed down in calendars by vicious fingers, just like my mother presses down her knees, fearing God wouldn't listen if she faced him, heads up. It's Christmas again, says the snarky calendar, and despite you not taking its word for it, I know it's true. Streets are cramped and damp, the touch-starved teachers are once again playing movies and sewing little white baby Jesuses, counting the days to set us free. Everything is just a little more dead. It's hot if you are under the equator, the ground cracking up, setting loose dry roots. If it were cold, the trees would be dead too, only more glamorously so. It is not December's fault. It, it's in its nature. I wonder if God made it the month of death so that his son would be born strong. Tell me again about time. Pass me down your cigarettes. That's right. That's right now. Should it taste like your thoughts? I see what you mean about calendars. Let's live out of it. If I learn it well, will you teach me? I promise it will never have to be December again, and we'll stop living in loopings at last. So my first thing is I was wondering what the intent is in capitalizing some of the lines that appear to be enjammed. So I do wonder if changing this to small caps could aid in the visual flow of the poem. So tell me again about how we, so we's capitalized, and I was just wondering visually if it needs to be capitalized or if that could just be turned into like a small letter instead of a capital W just for like visual flow. So I also noted that I think that the line breaks could actually work a little bit harder for the poem in a different place, in different places. I think that this poem is fantastic in terms of content and the line break is such a powerful aspect in poetry that can really do a lot. So my hack with line breaks that I like to implement is breaking at a strong verb or on a word that can serve as a bridge meaning slash double meaning between two phrases. There are so many combinations. So I wonder what the poem would look like if the poem read as the following. So this was my example. So if we look at my um, line breaks, which is of course just an example so that the writer may understand like kind of where I'm coming from. Tell me again is on its own line, which is a bit commanding. Original tell me again about how it's not bad by any means. I think that that also works. It, it's a bit more of like an open-ended line. So whatever the writer is going for, but this was just my example. How we were born at the same instant, even though you're older, wiser. So I put wiser on this line because the next line is for you can always be. So it almost looks like for you can always be wiser. One day ahead of time on this earth only if you go. So if only you go far enough from me. It almost reads as if only you go to the earth, but then you read the next line far enough from me. If only you go, it's not just go, but go far enough from me. And so there's a little bit more um, meaning here, I think, with the, the line break. And the poem also looks a little bit more balanced on the page. When critiquing poetry, I also like to keep in mind the poem's physical shape on the page. And I definitely think that the shape that the writer has is okay, but it works. But I do think that it is a bit imbalanced. Like, for you can always be one day ahead of time is a bit longer than the rest of these lines. And so just looking at balancing out the line length. I also suggested perhaps making this his own stanza because it repeats tell me line and comes at a natural end point. The original stanza looked like that, I think. Um, so this was like a much, much longer. But because it does repeat the tell me again, tell me again, I think it does work on its own and might actually help in the flow. I think having it here is okay. But what it can do is it almost starts the cycle of reading over again because tell me again about how blah 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 and then we get to an end point with a period here seems like a very natural end point but then if we start again with tell me again it does seem like we have to kind of start all over from where we were reading whereas if you put it in a second stanza there's a little bit more um r room to breathe and it seems like a more natural end point so this stanza uh stanza kind of that I created stanza to tell me again how time it gave me chills with the represent repetition of presses like man-made press down in calendars like my mother presses down her knees like fantastic I did think that there was a bit of room to tweak the line breaks again just so that they can work a little bit harder I think line breaks are also a very like personal thing to a poet so obviously this is not telling the poet you got to do this because this is really dependent on the poet's vision. But um, just an example of what a little bit more the line break can do in this instance. So here, 
um, press down in calendars by vicious fingers just like my mother presses down is now its own line. Her knees fearing God is now its own line. But if you read it together, my mother presses down her knees fearing God. But on its own, now the lines are my mother presses down and her knees in particular fear God. This is another example of like adding double meanings to lines with the line break. The original was my mother presses down her knees fearing break. God wouldn't listen if she faced him. And I think that that also works. Um, but these are just some ideas also of how to um, balance out sort of like the visual like length of the poem, um, just because there are some shorter lines here and then longer lines, just sort of making it a bit more uh, equal on the page. I really adore how the touch star teachers are once again playing movies and sewing little white baby Jesus's plays out on the page. I think there's so much beautiful language. So another thing about line breaks for the poet to consider that it's better to end words off on like verbs, like I was saying, stronger verbs or like a natural break rather than on like a preposition, um, which is like, is like of, um, kind of like bridge words. Instead of ending on like a bridge word, end on a stronger, stronger word. Um, and so that's something that the right. So I, one thing I wanted to point out here is that I wonder if God made it the month of death. I actually thought that the abstraction here was really earned. Abstractions in poetry can be a little bit of like a double-edged sword. They're kind of difficult to handle because they're really, really big words. Just abstractions in general are gigantic. And so they can come across as a bit melodramatic sometimes, but I think the writer does a fantastic job at earning the abstraction here. It works so well, especially with the second line after that. So his son would be born strong. Like how fantastic is that? The word death versus strong, that juxtaposition is just fantastic. And so this is a great example of the poet working with fantastic concrete details earlier and earlier stanzas so that this abstraction is the only one and that it's very earned in this instance. So something else that I noticed before I close off on this one is that the first and final stanza, there are like less immersive details. So this is more of like a, like a story tale beginning like once upon a time kind of almost stanza. And then the end is almost like a once upon a time stanza. And in my original reading, one of my first readings, I read this poem many times because it's just fantastic. I actually was wondering whether or not the poet could end on this stanza because this last line, I wonder if God made it the month of death so that his son would be born strong is such a fantastic line. It is like, a punch to the face at how good that is. So I was wondering even if the writer could take details from this stanza, the final stanza, and pepper them throughout these stanzas so that this content is still there, but there's less emphasis on them so that this feels a bit more finite and end. So we stop living in loopings at last obviously has an image of looping. So there's not really an end point, which could work depending on what the poet wants. But these are just things that, you know, we talk about in workshop, like, uh, depending on your intention here. So looping is a looping connotation. So everything is just like a circle of life. Whereas these last two lines in this stanza, I wonder if God made it the month of death so his son would be born strong is very finite. It's like punched in the dirt. It's not going anywhere. So whatever the poet wants the reader to feel at the end. I had a TA who was like, sweaty words are what you want on the page. And what she meant by that is like words that work hard. And so in this instance, sweaty line breaks, line breaks that really work hard for the line. Thank you so much for submitting Kim. And the last critique for this video is from Katie. This is a prose piece. It's adult literary fiction, short fiction. It's called Butcher's Autumn. The day the long winds rolled in at the end of my 18th summer was the first time I ever saw my father weep. Silently, quietly, as he watched the leaves on the ancient trees in our garden rattle and shake, signaling the cyclical shift in seasons. The grove of trees beyond was so unlike the strong oaks or pine trees that lined the northern and eastern parts of our town. They stood like soldiers, their skin thick, spindly arms raised in prayer. The leaves were faded and dull, green like other summer leaves, but washed out as if the mother that birthed them had run them underwater too long. The town's histories began and ended with those trees. The days the trees bled, we all knew winter trailed not too far behind. Their leaves crispened up like the skin of the roasted pig we ate at the moon festivals. The sap pooled and dripped behind the silvery bark leaking through the cracks, razored slashes against pale flesh. Then came the winds, and our town was hazed in red, it covered our gardens, streets, and shutters with blood. 
The unfortunate few who wandered too close were covered in arterial spray, and those that licked their lips and tasted the sickly sweet sap gathered at the corner of their mouths died screaming. A small, fatal mistake, because despite how tantalizing it smelled, the sugar-spun scent only masked the darkened poison underneath, corroding the mouth, throat, teeth, stomach. Butcher's Autumn was coming. My first comment was, I really like this start, but I do wonder if there's a way to reduce wordiness in this first sentence by inverting the sentence structure. So it may read, the first time I ever saw my father whip the long winds verbed at the end of my 18th summer, something like that. So I've also highlighted was, which is the to be verb in this instance. And I wonder if avoiding a to be verb so early could increase the first sentence's urgency, or if the structure needs to say the same for the intention. I wonder if the writer could just say at the end of my 18th summer, just to live in the prose a bit. So the day the long winds rolled in at the end of my 18th summer, instead of saying the day the long winds rolled in, the writer could just say at the end of my 18th summer, the first was the first time I ever saw my father weep something just to reduce the wordiness um, on the page it does look a bit heavier I think reading it out loud there's not as much of a problem but the day the long winds rolled in at the end of my 18th summer was the first time I ever saw my father weep because of this to be verb here um, there's a lot more room for more words which can increase the wordiness in the first sentence so I just wonder if this could just be consolidated a little bit I also suggested here the leaves were faded and dull green like the other summer leaves were washed out as if the mother had burnt them etc I suggested perhaps remove this faded and dull because it's already established with the simile right after so they're green like the, like the other summer leaves but washed out so that's already indicating that they're faded and dull so I wonder if that detail is even necessary I thought that blood was like an interesting way to describe the leaves falling but as I read I wasn't actually sure if they were legitimately bleeding and I will get onto that a little bit later I was also wondering here this is where I started to realize as I was critiquing if they're leaking like physical blood, are like the trees shedding their leaves or are they actually bleeding? I think that could be clarified just a little bit. So what I said in my larger comment is I just think a, even a single sentence clarifying what is factually occurring could help in grounding the image that you've beautifully constructed here. So what is actually happening here is kind of what I wanted to get out of this. I think that the pro style is fantastic. I think the words have really earned their spots. The details are fantastic. I just wasn't certain on the concept because I think naturally like we hear a lot of analogies for like leaves falling so I wasn't sure if this was just like another analogy and I thought that that was really beautiful at first but then from some of the descriptions like the sap pooled and dripped behind the silvery bark I wasn't actually sure if they were physically actually bleeding and so I think a little bit of clarification on that especially with the title butcher's autumn butcher is kind of like telling me perhaps it's like actually blood. So if it is actually blood, perhaps that could just literally be clarified. Like maybe um, the narrator could have like touched some of the blood. I don't know if that is even possible or like seen blood like dripped down on the streets or something just so that a reader knows this is physical blood and not leaves, especially since like autumn leaves can be like red in color, just like how everything is described here. So I think just a little bit more of conceptual clarity because the day the trees bled, I was reading bled as like they were shedding their leaves, but maybe they're actually bleeding. But so we all knew Winter Trail not too far behind. That's just like how like autumn is like here, like at least in Ontario, like the leaves shed and then it's winter. And so I wasn't sure if I was like misreading um, the concept. So I, perhaps just like a little bit of clarification on what the concept actually is a little bit earlier on. So I said perhaps like the second paragraph would be a great way to sort of clarify that. Is this like actually like just normal autumn or is this like bloody autumn? I wasn't certain. So just clarifying the concept before like the end of like this first page could just be helpful in establishing the actual concept. So I, I wasn't sure, maybe it's like poisonous sap. Um, so I think that could just be a little bit more amped up in the second paragraph. Like what's actually happening in this town because it sounds really harrowing. So that's it for the critiques for this video. Again, thank you so much to everybody who submitted. Again, I will try my best to get the second part of this video up as soon as possible, but I hope you guys found this helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Bye.